Harry will now solve all the world's problems with a description of... Uh, I think I need a... You need this thing. Um, well, um, let me just introduce you. Okay. So Harold Croto is uh, currently at Florida State University. He was Sussex before that. He's a former president of the Royal Society of Chemistry and a Nobel laureate from 1990s. I can't remember either. Don't worry. For <laughs> discovering uh, with uh, Rick Smalley the um, C60, the structure of um, carbon 60, which he was instrumental in naming Buckminster Fullerene. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you, Roger, for inviting me to... A, normally, I'm in the company of Nobel Prize winners, but um, now I realize I'm in the company of some people who are a lot smarter <laughs> in many ways, and I'm sort of I'm certainly worried about, about this. And, uh, but anyway, um, I, th I think I'd like to start with um, a Nobel laureate, John Cornforth, who's a great friend of mine, and particularly with regard to the teapot. Um, I actually do believe in the teapot, after John pointed out that um, what about an astronaut who just decided to throw out a teapot out of his spaceship, and therefore there could be a, a teapot uh, circling at least uh, the Earth. And uh, the point is that, you know, we still don't know. But the talk, my talk is actually the Enlightenment is under threat. Can it be saved by the Internet? And I'm going to discuss... Uh, my small part in my attempts, I think something that uh, is interesting about the printing press is that the printing press enabled people all, all over the world to start to write about themselves and the things that they, they made an impact. I don't think there was any general education before the, in, before the printing press. And I think the Internet has a new dimension of audiovisual materials. But the scale of the problem, it seems to me, is, is vast. Um, I mean, we have an audience here of not too many, but these are the, the audiences of evangelicals and in, in obviously in Mecca and other places of all people. Um, and uh, this is in Nigeria where they converted apparently in, in one week about a million uh, people to, uh, to Christ evangelical Christianity. And they pro those people probably paid as well. And so <laughs> um, I did actually find two people in the crowd here. Rick Richard and Sam Harris were actually those little two black spots in there. But they were, they, they were somewhat outnumbered, it seemed to me. Uh, the assets of the, uh, are, are phenomenal, and as you all know, those are just the capital. The $88 billion that went into, uh, in the UK, in the US, into religious um, institutions is just enormous. The $400 million budget um, for the Campus Crusade for Christ. And I talked to a couple of these guys on the FSU campus, and as soon as I started to, um, to ask them questions which troubled them, they had a, a defense mechanism that one dragged the other guy away. It was very interesting to see that they've got this defense mechanism. That they only want to project what they have to say, but uh, there was no discussion with me that was possible. Um, indoctrination, which I think Richard has talked about, is just phenomenal. It's in, increasing in the UK as a Christian play school, madrasa in the old days. In fact, there's a Sikh in the middle here of Muslim children as a modern madrasa. Uh, Cheder in probably in Poland and Jewish children today. It seems to me that uh, these are sort of issues. I think we only need to look at um, Northern Ireland. This is Newsweek magazine. That's interesting. We've got Newsweek magazine many years ago. Gerald, 12, if I were Prime Minister of Northern Ireland, this is how I would solve our problems. Uh, first, I would split Northern Ireland into two parts, and I would put the Protestants on one side and the Catholics on the other. David, 14, I would pass a law saying that any Roman Catholic who set foot on the street to start trouble would be shot instantly and without mercy. I would starve them like rats until there wasn't one left in Northern Ireland. I believe that the separate school system in Northern Ireland was responsible for propagating the attitudes that were there in, in the family. And I think we must try to s sort of work against faith schoolings, um, particularly in the UK, which, in fact, we have uh, a minister for education who used to be a member of Opus Dei and a prime minister who apparently seems to think he's answerable to God for the, his uh, acceptance of going into Iraq and if this is nature. There are problems with politicians, and I hope that you, we can hear this. Okay, welcome back. We're ready to resume have the our sound. discussion of the 105th Congress during your visit here for inauguration. And uh, we're very pleased to have with us the Senate I, Majority I can't. Leader, Trent Lott of Mississippi, if you'd help us. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Okay, we 
Oh, sorry about that. Okay, it's gone, it's gone again. And um, for some reason. Okay, welcome back. We're ready to resume our discussion of the 105th Congress during your visit here for inauguration. And uh, we're very pleased to have with us the Senate Majority Leader, Trent Lott of Mississippi, if you'd help us welcome him. Thank you, Senator Lott. Good morning. I would like to know what advice would you give to a prospective student who is interested in following a career path similar to a senator? Similar to a senator? Yes. Well, first of all, I want to encourage you to take maximum advantage of your educational opportunities. Uh, we live in a great country, and we have a, a great educational system that's not perfect. Uh, we spend an awful lot of money that doesn't always give us the results that we want. But I can assure you, whatever you want to do in life, uh, education will help you get a faster start. For instance, um, when I was in high school, if you were in the so-called pre-college uh, curriculum, you had to take four years of science and four years of math. A waste of my time, a waste of the teacher's time, and a waste of space. You know, I, I took physics. For what? Uh, <laughs> uh oh, every physics teacher in America is out to lynch me. Physics is great, and I think we need the best possible physics teachers and the best uh, students in physics we can get if you're going into physics or mathematics or science or medicine. But if you want to be a lawyer and you know that's where you're headed, maybe you'd be better off taking an economics course, a typing course, a computer course, or music, for heaven's sake, because it's good for the soul. Uh, <laughs> now, hmm, there are a number of lessons to be gained from that. And the first is um, that... Um, he was giving the kids a mandate not to know anything about the science and engineering and maths, which actually underpins their whole lives. He stopped. He was a master. He knew he'd done this before. He, could, he waited for the applause. All those kids were applauding. It was, it was terrible. It is terrible. But worst of all was music is good for the soul, but science and maths isn't. And so we, we have that, those sort of massive problems against us. There's another group, um, and it's, I think, the fifth column within the scientific community. Uh, what did we find in the cosmic barrel without premeditated <laughs> ideas? We had no idea this molecule was there, and yet we discovered it. And that led to this place. I drew this when I was about 13. It's Stockholm Town Hall, and I ended up shaking hands with this guy. I, at the same time, cold fusion was out there. And in fact, the first five papers that, um, that were written about our work said we were wrong. And I went through them carefully. I knew that they, we would one day prove them incorrect. But cold fusion was quite interesting because they were looking for cold fusion. And, and I think they did an experiment, and they thought they'd seen it. I, I think they, at the start, they certainly were, I think, honest scientists. And there's no possibility of us disproving that they didn't actually see cold fusion at that time. I think it's unlikely. Most, almost all the scientific community doesn't believe it, and yet I understand that some people do, that there was cold fusion. Now what else can we find in the barrel, the cosmic barrel, with premeditated ambitions? Well, I say there is an infinite amount of junk at the bottom of the cosmic barrel. And those who scrape around in it will surely find a half-eaten apple. If that search is carried out with a mind clouded by the mystical fog of childhood teaching in an attempt to resolve the plethora of philosophical problems that I had, that all of us have, one will just as surely convince oneself that the bit of apple bears Adam's teeth marks. I think that's the same almost as cold fusion in, this, in many ways. And here's a friend of mine, Charlie Towns, a uh, fantastic scientist. Um, really, the, one of the greatest contributions in, of the 20th century is the laser, maser, to optical surgery, to communications. He wrote, wrote a wonderful book on microwave sp spectroscopy, my, my field. I've read it from cover to cover, eloquently written. And uh, he, that, he wrote an article. We, he ended up in London receiving the Templeton Prize. Now, I am pretty sure that he wouldn't have won that prize had he not been Charlie Towns. Because I asked him, I interviewed him, he said he wasn't quite sure. He wrote an article about it and 
I think there are lots of articles out there, and I, I'm somewhat surprised that that was the case. Now, I'm not going to say anything what I think myself, but this is something of the power of the Internet, because if you look at the Templeton Prize on some websites, when one accepts money or prizes from the Templeton Foundation, one's name becomes inextricably linked, not only logically, but also explicitly, on their website with their philosophy, their goals, and their efforts. But I do think it is worth pointing out that the consequences of association with the Templeton Foundation, and to hope that, at the very least, scientists who do not subscribe to Templeton's views of science and religion won't allow their names to be used in support of them. For example, here is a quote by Templeton himself. From a theological perspective, it is indeed tempting to see this remarkable self-organizing tendency as an expression of the intimate nature of the creator's activity and identification with our universe. There are strong hints of ultimate realities beyond the cosmos. One of the strongest hints, in our opinion, relates to the new understanding of the creativity of the cosmos, its capacity for so-called so self-organization. It's not me saying this. It's out there on the Internet. Sean Carroll, a physicist of the University of Chicago, declined an invitation to speak at a Templeton-sponsored conference held last fall, which featured 16 Nobel laureates and was endorsed by the APS. Carroll explained in his blog that the entire purpose of the Templeton Foundation is to blur the line between straightforward science and explicitly religious activity, making it seem like the two enterprises are part of one big undertaking. Carroll admitted that he had been tempted by the $2,000 honorarium. Eugene said, if I'm given 1.5 million bucks by the Church of England to support Christianity, I'm pretty sure I don't have the will to resist. Yes, I'm weak, but 1.5 million bucks is a lot of money. I don't have enormous problems with the beliefs of people who think that science and religion don't overlap, although I know that many of you do. My problem is with their methodology. However, money is useful, as, as I will demonstrate to anyone who wants to give me some. <laughs> I, there are great kids. Young, and these, I think these are pretty young people out there. Now, I have a, some messages, and I want for the Templeton Foundation that I think it would get a great deal of uh, value if it actually gave the next year's award to Richard Dawkins. Now, I think that would indicate something and that it really does want to actually bring science and religion and comparisons uh, as, as they claim. So that's my first piece of advice. And by the way, Richard, if they do give it you, I want 10% of the, <laughs> at least, at least a crate of wine. Anyway, uh, that, 